The Martin RB-57 Canberra here at the Selfridge Military Air Museum is a pretty aircraft with a rich British pedigree, elegantly integrated twin engines, and an impressive operational history. The story of how this British bomber came into U.S. service is an interesting one, and it includes a fascinating footnote, a little-known aircraft called the Martin XB-51, a plane so obscure it never even got a name. It almost looks like several different model airplanes were randomly glued together into one after their instructions had been lost. Two engines from a four-engine Boeing 707, maybe, but mistakenly glued to the nose of the airplane. The tail from a British Victor bomber, but with another engine kind of randomly tucked underneath. The wings look like they were upsized from an F-86 Sabre. And because it needed a canopy, sort of looks like someone just glued on a spare bubble canopy from a model of a P-51D Mustang. The fuselage, well, I have no idea where this kind of boxy-looking square-sided fuselage may have come from. But quite obviously, that's not how the XB-51 was designed. In fact, it's quite the opposite. The XB-51's inventor, the Glenn Martin Company, is mostly known for the World War II B-26 Marauder medium bomber, and also for its innovative seaplane designs. These include the P-5M Marlin and the interesting P-6M Seamaster, a really cool-looking jet-powered seaplane that was canceled from active service at the very last second. One thing I'll suggest about the Martin XB-51, this aircraft has never gotten the credit it deserved, and history has unfortunately largely forgotten it. If you do a search on Amazon for books about the XB-51, you might find some out-of-print titles selling it a premium to eccentric collectors and aviation weirdos, like me. And there's one new title from about 2011 that's really only two books. Aviation expert Eric Simonson wrote what may be the most authoritative insight into the XB-51 program in his excellent 2016 book, U.S. Combat Aircraft Fly-Off Competitions. But as I researched the fascinating story of the XB-51, my understanding of the airplane and the true genius behind it truly began to develop. According to one of the best literary resources on the XB-51 by author Scott Libus, published in 1998 by the noted expert in obscure aviation history, Mr. Steve Gintner, the XB-51 was part of a review board competition in 1951 to find a replacement for the World War II vintage A-26. Although, as XB-51 authority Logan Hartke points out, this competition is not what the XB-50 was specifically designed for. There were four competing aircraft being considered by this review board. The propeller-driven North American AJ-1 Savage, a cool-looking plane. The Canadian-built CF-100. The British-designed English Electric Canberra, right here. The unconventional Martin XB-51, arguably the most advanced, but certainly the weirdest-looking of the quartet. Obviously, the XB-51 wasn't selected in the Air Force's evaluation. The B-57 Canberra was. That's why this plane is here, and they're are no more XB-51s. But as you continue to research the XB-51, you begin to appreciate the genius behind it, and the more you wonder why it wasn't selected by the U.S. Air Force. Only two XB-51s were built by Martin for the Air Force, making it one of history's most exotic aircraft. The XB-51 used unusual, at the time, inline bicycle landing gear with outriggers on the wings. The successful B-52 Stratofortress, the less successful B-47 Stratojet, and the still-relevant U-2 reconnaissance aircraft have a similar landing gear configuration. In a stroke of practical genius, the XB-51 was the first jet aircraft that could be refueled from a single fuel inlet, making ground support significantly easier. Now today, the F-35 Joint Strike Fighter has this feature, along with most other modern jet aircraft. And now the story gets really interesting. The XB-51 had a variable incidence wing from 3 to 7 degrees. That's airplane speak for a wing that could be adjusted up or down at the leading edge to generate more lift. The Vought F-8 Crusader also had some reasonable success with this design. The XB-51 had a novel, and one may suggest revolutionary, rotary bomb bay designed by Werner Buchall and Albert Woolens. I did some digging online at the U.S. Patent Office website under the design idea Rotary Bomb Bay Door. Sure enough, under patent number U.S. 263-4656A, there was Buchal and Woolen's patent. 
Today, the B-1B bomber has a rotary bomb dispenser in its bomb bay, not quite the same as the Martin XB-51, but remarkably similar. Think that's more than coincidence? Even the plane that beat the XB-51 in the initial competition, the B-57 Canberra, was later modified to have a rotary-style bomb bay remarkably similar to the XB-51. The XB-51 was featured in a 1956 Hollywood movie called Toward the Unknown, kind of an early Top Gun. The film features some beautiful aerial photography, and it features a version of the XB-51 that Hollywood called the XF-120. Super cool movie, you gotta see it. All these insights into the XB-51 can't help but make you wonder two things. Why wasn't the XB-51 selected by the U.S. Air Force? And then secondly, and perhaps more interestingly, what would have happened if it were? Two aviation authorities, both masters of forensic aircraft history in the vast gray realm of alternate history, Mr. Logan Hartke and Mr. Eric Simonson, have done extensive research into both of these questions. Firstly, there's the usual crackpot theories about why the XB-51 wasn't selected by the Air Force. They include conspirational ideas, like the Air Force didn't like the way the XB-51 looked, or they had some kind of institutional reluctance to buy an aircraft from a company known for working with the Navy. But the highly successful F-4 Phantom in Air Force service debunks both of these theories. The Phantom started out as a Navy aircraft, and, well, as far as strange-looking aircraft go, I think it took the world a decade to embrace the Phantom's oddly angular appearance. Mr. Logan Hartke points out that, according to 1950s Cold War doctrine, strategic bombing and nuclear weapons would surely carry the day in any future conflict. So, smaller attack aircraft were merely a solution looking for a problem in the eyes of many Air Force generals. Hartke's interpretation is likely correct, and it converges with Mr. Eric Simonson's observation that the Air Force may have been attracted to a better cost-effective sales alternative with the English electric B-57 Canberra. But like many great sales pitches, after the handshakes were over, the costs of actually maintaining and updating the B-57 began to mount just like all big defense contracts usually do. In fact, Hartke points out that the USAF went on to acquire the twin-engine B-66 destroyer for use in Vietnam in addition to the B-57 they were already using. An operational version of the XB-51, as depicted by both Hartke and Simonson in their artwork, may have been able to perform as well or even better than both the B-57 and B-66, but for the price of just one aircraft. Both Logan Hartke and Eric Simonson have created a fascinating set of images depicting what an operational B-51 may have looked like and how the program might have evolved in the real world. Notice that Hartke's images, made in cooperation with Sean Little, include the addition of some sensors on the nose that we saw on the B-57 in Vietnam. And Simonson depicts the aircraft's mission as being predominantly low and medium altitude attack. Hartke understood that the cockpit configuration would likely be changed to a tandem arrangement so that both crew members sat at the top of the aircraft for better visibility, crew comfort, and also safety. In this in interesting depiction, Simonson even imagined what the B-51 may have looked like in RAF service if England had bought the B-51 from America instead of America buying the B-57 from England. This entire exercise in forensic history is interesting because retrospection from experts like Simonson and Hartke costs our defense industry nothing and may provide cost-saving insights into future defense acquisitions and strategy. It also makes you wonder, would the U.S. have been better served by an operational B-51 than the B-57? We'll never really know for sure. Whatever happened to the two XB-51 prototypes anyway? Well, too late to make a long story short, but the simple answer is they were both lost in accidents that were attributed to pilot error. This was a tragic loss of a truly remarkable aircraft that was robbed of its rightful place in history and never survived to be displayed at the National Museum of the Air Force in Dayton, Ohio. I would have loved to have seen it. It's really a shame after all this research. But unfortunately, we're left with a few good books about the aircraft, one really cool movie, and a lot of interesting speculation about what might have been. But even more than the practicalities of studying the XB-51 program, there's something alluring about its rarity, its obscurity. Aviation nutjobs like me are always looking for little-known esoteric aircraft knowledge 
and all aviation enthusiasts love a great story. And I'll argue the story of the mostly forgotten Martin XB-51 checks every single one of those boxes as one of aviation history's most interesting and least known exotic programs that vanished into the ether of historic obscurity.